Okay, I think we'll get started. So welcome to the second of the Harvard Data Science Initiatives Industry Seminar Series this fall. Um, I'm David Parks. I'm one of the faculty co-directors of the Harvard Data Science Initiative. This series is one of the important ways that we connect with the broader data science community outside of the university. One thing I did want to mention before I introduce our speaker is that there will be plenty of time for questions. We'll be using the Q&A feature. Please ask questions during the presentation using Q&A as well as afterwards. And also please know the event is being recorded. Um, in introducing our speaker, let me start with uh, uh, welcoming Chester Kerm. He's a data scientist at Kensho Technologies. I want to mention that um, in normal times, Kensho is our neighbor in Harvard Square. Uh, they're also a subsidiary of SMP Global. Uh, Chester holds a BA in physics and mathematics from Middlebury College and a PhD in physics from Boston University. And prior to joining Kensho, Chester worked as a quantitative analyst in fixed income at Loomis Sales & Co. Today, Chester is a technical lead at Kensho for the data extraction team. And we're gonna hear in his presentation about the crucial role of timely access to data in the investing world, especially working with unstructured data and using machine learning for going from unstructured data to structured data. Uh, take it away, Chester. Thanks, David. And uh, thanks very much uh, for having me. Um, so again, my name is Chester Kerm. I work at Kensho Technologies, which is a small financial technology company headquartered in Harvard Square. Um, so our parent company, as they mentioned, S&P Global, is a much larger financial institution that many of you have probably heard of. Uh, they are a ratings agency and they uh, publish indices like the S&P 500 um, and many, many, many other things. So we were acquired by them uh, just about two years ago. Uh, so my talk today is titled Machine Learning for Data Extraction. Uh, so I thought I would show you a small corner of the economy that I've been learning about for the past few years that concerns itself with something called structured data extraction. So I will uh, explain what I mean by that and show some exciting developments there that are being enabled by new technology. So that is uh, more or less what I had planned, but I am happy to talk about uh, Kensho or S&P Global or data science and industry in general or the financial industry or anything uh, you have questions about that you think I could answer. Um, so please feel free to interrupt with questions. I'll be looking at the Zoom Q&A uh, feature. So hopefully that goes smoothly. Otherwise, there'll be time for questions at the end as well. Um, okay, so some very quick background on myself, um, though David already kind of gave it. Uh, I studied physics in graduate school. Um, I then worked at an asset management firm for two years as a quant in uh, fixed income. And for the past uh, three to four years, I've been at Kensho, where I now manage a small team of machine learning engineers. Uh, so what is Kensho? Until about two years ago, Kensho was a, uh, was a startup. So our headquarters is in Harvard Square on Brattle Street, um, actually in what used to be uh, City Sports. So some of you probably uh, have seen or know the building. Uh, we also have offices in uh, New York City and the DC area and a small presence in Los Angeles. Um, although we're all working from home these days. Uh, so Kensho is, it's about 150 people, 100 to 150. We are mostly engineers, so over half of the full-time employees are engineers. Um, something in the chat, okay. Um, sorry, though we have, uh, you know, project management roles uh, as well. Um, I would describe it as a uh, nerdy place, maybe somewhat academic. Uh, it's a good place, I enjoy working there. Uh, so quick history of, of the company. Uh, we were founded in 2013. Some of our early investors included Google and Goldman Sachs. Uh, this is sometimes used to describe uh, what we do, though it doesn't really tell you too much. Um, we actually got our start uh, developing software that analyzed the impact of events on financial markets. Um, so we had teams of people 
that used various semi-automated means um, to assemble these vast taxonomies of events. And you can think of these like financial events, or sorry, news events. So um, for instance, we had timestamps on uh, every time North Korea fires a missile or uh, a hurricane made landfall in the United States, um, or a self-driving car uh, hits somebody, something like this. Uh, and using our software, you could ask questions uh, about how uh, certain events impact financial markets. So for instance, uh, what uh, technology stocks are most affected when Apple announces a new iPhone? Or what happens to cement stocks when a hurricane hits the United States? Things like that. So we sold the software to uh, big banks and hedge funds and asset managers. Um, and many of these, many of the large banks became investors as well in, in the company. Uh, we worked a little bit with InQtel, uh, which is the venture arm of the CIA, to see if we could extend our technology to uh, the intelligence industry, though I honestly don't know too much about that. Um, and later on, we worked with and were acquired by S&P Global. So that is our history in a nutshell. Uh, so what do we do now? Well, as you can imagine, we work a lot with S&P, and S&P actually has vast troves of data. Um, so we are sort of an innovation hub uh, that tries to leverage these volumes of data to build products using new technology. Uh, so I'll give a few examples. Um, S&P has an online platform called the Market Intelligence Platform, and we are powering the search capability there to make it as magic as possible. Uh, we have tools to acquire and link new data. So imagine you have a database with uh, millions of companies in it, and you acquire a new database, which has millions of other companies. And a lot of these companies are the same, but you know, their names are slightly different and their addresses and phone numbers you know, might have slight variations. So we have technology to link those together in an, in an automated way and identify which records uh, are referencing the same thing. And we do a lot of natural language processing as well. So for instance, we have a product uh, that, that uh, will comb through large amounts of text and find references to uh, people, places, organizations, companies, this sort of thing, um, and maybe, you know, highlight the page in Cap IQ or the uh, S&P plat platform. Um, yeah. So I'm happy to talk more about any of these, uh, but today I wanted to focus on a particular project, uh, which uh, we call data extraction. Um, so this roughly, I mean, a process uh, that will take unstructured data. So you can think of this like um, a PDF document, for example, or even a scan or an image of a document. So some sort of unstructured document and produce structured data. And by this, I roughly mean uh, typically tabular data, um, you know, where that is clean, uh, maybe standardized and can be worked with programmatically, maybe uh, put into a database with a certain schema or uh, sent to downstream processes. Um, so there was actually a recent XKCD comic, this is from a couple of weeks ago, about data extraction. Um, so on the left, it says what tech people think scientists need help with, and the tech pe people think scientists need fancy algorithms or something like this. And on the right, it says what scientists actually need, and, and it says our lab was infested by wasps for a few weeks, so we had to take pictures of the equipment through the window. How do you get graphs from a Polaroid photo into Excel? Um, so this, this sounds like a very hard problem, uh, but were this possible, this would be an example of data extraction. So taking something like an image uh, of a graph um, and uh, sort of massaging it into a form where you can work with it in Excel, um, this would give you some, some structured data from some unstructured image. Uh, maybe to, to motivate this better, um, you know, may, maybe it's plain to all of you, hopefully so, but there is a, there is a demand for structured data. So to go through sort of a contrived example, um, suppose you are an investor and for some reason you are interested in large British banks. Um, and maybe, you know, you, you have to choose where to put your money. So, uh, you know, you have to maybe select or rank um, these banks. So maybe you're looking for banks that are cheap relative to the assets they own. Um, so this is a shameless plug for the uh, S&P online platform, um, but using the search functionality, you can type in in natural language something like, um, UK banks with market cap greater than 10 billion ranked by P slash B. P slash B here 
uh, it means price per book. It's just a financial ratio. So if you type this in, you will get what you will get out are, uh, I guess, all five banks with headquarters in the United Kingdom with a market cap over 10 billion um, ranked by their price to book ratio. So you can see here that Barclays has the lowest price per book ratio. This is not investment advice. Um, this is just an example of how we can use structured data to uh, compare entities. So in this case, to compare these things based on this one number that they all share. Um, okay, so suppose you wanted to build this from scratch, not the search experience. You just want to support you know, uh, queries on, on this, these kind of data. So what do you need? Um, this is contrived. I'm making this up, but, but you need something like this. You need some table with references to companies, uh, you know, maybe financial, different financial metrics like price to book or, you know, net assets or revenue, things like this. Maybe you need dates, uh, numeric values. Maybe there are currencies attached to these things. Um, so this is what we need to generate to support, you know, at, at the very least to support, uh, you know, a, a product like this. Um, so the interesting question is like, what, what do we have? Um, well, if you go to the investor relations page for a company like Barclays, you can see the raw material that we have to work with. And they are frequently, uh, unstructured documents like PDFs. Um, often they are annual or quarterly reports that the companies publish, um, and, and put up here, for instance. So this is sort of the raw material. Um, that we need to, uh, to use in order to support a product uh, like what I just showed you. So if you open up one of these annual reports, um, this is all public, uh, you see something like this. So it has a cover page, it has uh, free flowing text and you know, nice looking diagrams. It might have uh, something like this on the right that looks like a table. And uh, frequently the data that we need lives in tables in documents like these. So uh, you just have like a PDF page that has the data that you are ultimately looking for. Um, so we have a problem, which is to take a PDF page or maybe even an image or a scan of a page, something definitely not meant to be interpreted by a computer. And we need to turn it into something uh, structured and machine readable. Um, so we might need to standardize financial metrics. We might need to uh, represent currencies in some consistent way. So here GBP instead of maybe the pound sign. You know, we, we, make, we have to make this beautiful purple and blue thing here. Um, I guess I'll pause there and ask if there are any questions about, uh, you know, the general, the general challenge. Um, okay, so I'll keep an eye, um, but I, I don't see any for now. Um, there is an additional challenge here, actually, which is that um, we need to be able to do this in an automated fashion. Is the metric P slash B in the doc? Um, so uh, P slash B, so P, the P is the price of their uh, stock, which fluctuates, you know, during, uh, you know, market hours. So that would typically not live in a, a document like this, um, but uh, the book value might live in, in this document. So P slash B was one example. You might also be looking for something like, you know, the total assets of, of the company. So these things, uh, you know, we don't have sort of minute granularity because they're not a um, reflection of, of public markets. Do you need to tune it for every um, doc structure? So there's another question, do you need to tune it for every doc structure? Um, we will get into that. So hope the answer is hopefully no. Um, so the because these there's basically no constraints on uh, what these PDFs can look like, the goal is to make it um, somewhat uh, generalizable. <clears throat> so it would be you know close to as smart as, uh, as if a person were, were reading this. So thanks, those are, those are good questions. Um, Okay, so uh, as I was saying, there's there's an additional challenge, which is that automation can be very important. So we can't just give this to a team of humans unassisted. Um, and I've come up with some reasons why. So uh, one is just the volume. So even just for public companies, there are already tens of thousands of those globally. 
each is issuing multiple reports per year. So quarterly, annual, semi-annual reports, each of those can be hundreds of pages. So one issue is just volume. Um, there are hundreds, if not financial line items that we are looking for. So it's really an alphabet soup. Um, I think there's some MBA students on the line that might be more familiar with some of these things, but there are, you know, EBT, EBIT, EBITDA, NAV, EPS, ROE, FFAO, all these things. Um, so there, there are close to a thousand that, that uh, we, actually, we actually look for. And it is not trivial to um, identify um, to identify or disambiguate references to these things. So for instance, um, a company might report its revenue using the word sales. So we might have to have some notion of aliases for these things. Um, can GPT do that is another question. Uh, maybe, uh, I guess the proof is in the pudding. So uh, we'll have to try, but okay. So another point is um, uh, in some cases we need to be able to do this as fast as possible. So. An example is earnings releases. Um, investors uh, may want to consume this information as soon as it's available. Um, so if we can automate it, this could, uh, in general, be faster than, than a person. Um, and lastly, and kind of interestingly, it might be unfortunate, but a uh, PDF as a file format still sort of reigns supreme globally. So in the US, we have SEC filings, which are in HTML. Um, and this buys us some additional structure. So, you know, we have table tags. It will say, here's a table. These are the rows. These are the columns, for instance. Still not totally structured. Um, but for the rest of the world, you have these crazy PDFs, and there are basically no rules um, in terms of the presentation. So this data can um, be presented uh, in, in any way you can imagine. Um, so there's this challenge to, to sort of generalize. Um, okay, so uh, what is so difficult about doing this for PDFs? You know, so uh, this is just a zoomed in image of a page from that table. Um, and you, with your eyes, uh, you know exactly what's going on, right? You say, this is a table, this is the row header, it says cash and balances at central banks is 126002, millions of pounds in 2018, right? That is, that is not too hard. Um, but to a computer, doing that same thing is not trivial uh, at all. And to uh, understand why, so to a computer, this page looks like this. So to a computer, a PDF page um, is, is literally some text boxes arranged in two dimensions, uh, sort of on a plane. Uh, so this is actually the information that we have to work with. For each one of these text boxes, we have its content maybe some information about the font or styling, and we have the coordinates of these four corners of its bounding box. Um, so as you can imagine, this is pretty, pretty difficult to work with. Um, something that I think is kind of funny about this is that uh, at first blush, this is not like an interesting problem. This is a pretty boring problem. I mean, if you look at the, uh, the words on your screen, None of these are sexy words. And the idea of finding tables in PDF documents, you know, on, on its own sounds like, you know, kind of humdrum. Uh, nonetheless, this is, this turns out to be a very rich problem that admits as solutions some of the most uh, recent developments in, in machine learning. Um, and basically all of the major technology companies are coming out with products to do, to do this thing. Um, so I thought that's, that's kind of interesting. Um, we can now go through maybe and break this down or identify some potential sub problems that we would need to solve to do this. So we may need to be able to identify table structures. So here's something we saw before. Maybe we need to say this is a table. It's not a paragraph. It's not an infographic. It's not a, a figure, um, but it's a table. Uh, we, in general, may need to parse potentially complicated tabular structures. So for instance, uh, this 2018 is a column header. Is, this is further described by uh, the date 31 December. Um, and this row header, cash and balances at central banks, we might need to know that this is a type of asset, which we might learn because of the word assets in bold right above it. Uh, and we need to be able to link all of these things. We need to associate all of these text boxes with, with the correct 
uh, number in the body of the table. So this turns out to be pretty difficult. Um, and maybe lastly, we, we need to uh, understand what is on the page. So here it says 2018. Uh, we might need to know that this is a year and not a number, or this is, this is interpreted as a year. Um, similar here, we have cash imbalances at central banks. Usually, at least uh, in, in, in our context, uh, you might have in your pocket some you know, hundreds of financial metrics that you are looking for, and you typically need to disambiguate these financial metrics. So maybe you're looking for something called cash at central banks. Um, so you have to be able to, to map or classify uh, what you read on in the page. So you might assign to it some, some numeric code. Um, so there's a question here. How do you distinguish between multiple references to the same financial light items in terms of tracking within the same document? For example, 10K might have financial tables with different values for the same variable in context of different sections covering a PDF. Um, I have, so what I'll say about this is, so the question is, um, you have a a uh, PDF document with maybe several, maybe different values uh, for the um, same financial metric. Um, what we tend to do is try to separate uh, some sort of like base level of problem that we might be able to learn um, from something we call like business logic. So uh, if, if we have cash imbalances at central banks as one number, and then we have some other table that has the same row header with a different number, um, we might give both of these things to a person. So ultimately, we still have a human in the loop. Um, and then the person can implement whatever um, sort of, uh, you know, additional rules that, that, uh, that they need to. So uh, the challenge here, which is, which is not at all difficult, or sorry, not at all easy, is to sort of find a, a boundary between what an automated system will do and what a, a person still, still needs to do. Um, let me know if I didn't answer your question. Um, okay, so um, probably some of you uh, can have are, are looking at this and thinking these are some machine learning problems. Um, and uh, what's interesting is there is a ton of activity in the space these days. So basically, all of the major cloud providers—Google, Amazon, Microsoft, for instance—are coming out with products. Um, to ingest arbitrary documents and extract some sort of structured uh, data from them. There's also lots of smaller, uh, not so small companies doing working on this right now. And uh, so these are all, a lot of these products are coming out in recent years and they are frequently backed by machine learning technologies. Um, so this is an area where machine learning is uh, genuinely adding value um, and is doing so like as, as we speak um, in industrial labs and um, and also in academia across the country. Uh, is the table extraction easier in MS Word format than PDF format? So uh, we actually have worked with Microsoft Word before. And, and yes, so basically like in, in something like Microsoft Word, you know, it will, sorry, this is, a, this is a live question. The question is, is it easier to extract in Microsoft Word format than PDF? Microsoft Word, you typically like know that there is a table. So you can actually read this in programmatically using certain clients. Um, and you will at least say, this is a table, these are the rows, these are the columns. Um, in a PDF, even understanding that you're looking at a table is, is not necessarily trivial. Um, okay, actually speaking to that a little bit, um, you're probably familiar with the uh, use of convolutional neural nets to uh, segment images. Uh, so for instance, you have a neural net that's looking for cats in photographs, so you can hand it a photograph, and if there's a cat, it will try to draw a box around it. So many of you are probably familiar with this. It turns out you can use the same technology to find uh, tables in images of pages. So you take your PDF page, you cast it to a PNG, um, you hand it to a model that's been trained, and it uh, will draw a box around the table. Um, so this can be used to uh, partition a page into uh, different logical sections. So maybe you partition, you hand off this region uh, to a table parser. Um, so this is something we have implemented. Uh, I'm happy to talk about uh, that some more. Um, you're probably also familiar with uh, text classification. So uh, I was trying to come up with like a classic example, but the classic example is maybe uh, you know spam detection. So you have an email and you have to classify if this is spam or not. Um, similarly, this this problem of disambiguating financial metrics, which I mentioned before, um, can be treated as text classification. So you see. 
the word sales um, and you have to say, aha, this is the revenue number I was looking for. You see uh, the text EPS and you have to say, aha, this is uh, earnings per share that I was looking for. Um, so this can be thought of as text classification, albeit a very high cardinality problem or somewhat high cardinality. So there are hundreds or thousands of classes, which brings some, some special challenges. And I'm happy to talk more um, about how we address those as well. Um, so as I mentioned, there's, there's also a ton of activity in academia and also in industrial research labs in this space. So um, I'm just going to go through a few examples uh, before wrapping up. So um, this is a paper from Facebook AI research. They combed through machine learning papers and learned to extract um, how different algorithms do on benchmark data sets. So, and uh, they actually decompose the problem very similar to how I mentioned. So they will go through the row and column headers of the tables in the PDF and say, this is a, uh, it's a benchmark data set, or this is a performance metric like R squared or AUC or something, or, uh, and this is a model. Um, and then they propagate this information to uh, the relevant numbers in the body of the table. Uh, I see another question here. The question reads, does Kensho leverage any of the stock tools available in uh, AW, sorry, yeah, stock tools available in AWS, Recognition, TextRack, Comprehend, or Azure? Um, so this is, this is a good question. Um, we have looked in particular at TextRack. Um, and I would say that, so, so we roll our own is, is the, the short answer. Um, there's a few reasons for that. Um, one of them is that we have to do some special logic on sort of on top. So this classification of financial metrics is something that you typically wouldn't find in a, uh, in a uh, commercial system. Um, so there, there's a certain level of customiza customization that we can't avoid. Um, things like TextRack will find tables for you. And honestly, like, so we, we did roll our own, but it would be defensible to just pay for TextRack at the volumes that we are processing. Um, financially, you could argue that it doesn't make sense. So I think TextRack charges about a cent and a half per page. Um, and if you add that up, it, it gets considerable at the volumes that, that we're working with. Um, but certainly like it would be like a, a viable solution would be to, um, appeal to some third party solution to like get the tables out of PDFs and then do some downstream work. Um, you know, so for instance, commercial tools, uh, typically don't, uh, do things like this. So, um, it might be very important to know that this number down here is associated with 31st December, but a lot of these commercial tools will, uh, put this into a grid structure. So you can put it in Excel, but there's some additional work that's required to not only have the tabular structure, but to understand, you know, that, uh, you know, it's not all just like uh, things within rows and columns. There are some sort of secondary connections that, that we have to work out, um, but that's a good question. Um, uh, so graph neural nets are uh, somewhat new or at least increasingly popular. So in some cases you can abandon uh, the notion of a table and actually start with uh, just learning connections between text boxes. So you can treat this as maybe an edge classification problem where uh, text boxes are nodes and you are learning um, how they are connected. So this is a picture I was just showing, um, but one approach to this would be to learn embeddings for these text boxes. Um, these become embeddings for nodes uh, and you can classify these edges as uh, existing or, or not. So this is uh, another approach that people are looking at. Um, and lastly, there's this whole information retrieval dimension. Um, so someone mentioned GPT-3. Uh, so, so this is separate, but, um, is, but sort of related because there's a language model. But so, so Google actually uh, uh, used question answering and sort of applied question answering technology to tables. So they came out this paper at Tapas this year. Um, and the basic idea is you have a table of data that can look like anything. So here we have wrestlers with their ranks. So Luthez, Ric Flair, I don't know these people. You can pose a question in natural language, like uh, which wrestlers were ranked in the bottom three, and it will uh, provide an answer. It'll say Dory Funk Jr., Dan Severn, Gene Kaniski. Um, actually, a, a number of, of uh, labs came out with similar papers this year, so including Facebook. So this is a, this is a pretty new idea. Um, that is actually all I had for today, but I'm happy to take additional questions and please feel free to, uh, write me over email, um, as well.
but I'll take uh, I'll take the yeah questions. thank you Chester that was awesome um, let's see if there are questions and while we're waiting I can ask you some as well but here's a here's a question coming in okay so the question reads can you leverage knowledge graphs e.g. S and P LinkedIn uh, to follow companies slash individuals um, so Kencho actually has a history with with knowledge graphs and and we have we have our own knowledge graph and we're sort of pushing the the boundaries of the technology there. Um, I will refer you to uh, uh, an open source project called the Graph Compiler. This is something we open sourced um, a couple years ago. Um, but I would say for um, data extraction, I would need to think about uh, exactly how we can uh, leverage knowledge graphs. Um, in, in some ways though, it's uh, ultimately, this is just like a more convenient representation to, uh, you know, for, for data that we would otherwise access in um, a relational database. Um, so one way that you could reference it is, or reference a knowledge graph is if you are looking for, let's see, so say you have a, 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 a SEC filing um, and you are looking for references to companies in the filing. Um, so maybe you have, uh, you know, an SEC filing from Apple and there is a, a reference to a company there. Maybe it's like Microsoft. Identifying what exactly, what company that is exactly can be pretty difficult. There's lots of companies uh, out in the world. People refer to them by different things. There are aliases. With a knowledge graph, if you have like some notion of competitors, you can maybe, uh, you know, restrict the search to just like uh, certain hops from from Apple, so I don't know if that if that made sense. Um, people of interest as they move around. Um, yeah, so I, I'd have to think of exactly how how to leverage an olive graph, but but it's a good question. Um, I, I guess we can we can talk about it offline. Um, here's a, another question. Recently, there has been a lot of emphasis on an efficiency of computation with growing data and model size. Do you face any computational challenges? At Ken show uh, yes a ton um, so uh, challenge of machine learning is that it can be expensive um, so some of these models uh, take days and days to train on high-end uh, hardware um, and the the sort of AWS bills can be uh, can be significant um, you know this is something just to be wary of I mean it's like machine learning is, is wonderful and can help do things that we weren't sure how to automate, but there's this additional challenge there of like maintaining the models, monitoring them, um, and training them. Um, you know, thanks to cloud computing, it's like we're not restricted by like literal hardware. Uh, it's more of just like a, a money thing. Um, we've actually partnered with NVIDIA um, in, in the past. So one of our projects, which I didn't mention, um, is uh, a speech to text project. So uh, just to, to give some context, um, companies hold earnings calls. And uh, during the earnings call, they're saying things. Um, and what you have is audio. Um, S&P employs a lot of people to uh, basically transcribe the earnings call. And then they publish a, a nice transcript. And uh, companies like um, hedge funds asset managers purchase these transcripts because the text is a lot easier to work with than, than the audio. And they do whatever they do. You know, So maybe they. Uh, look for companies where the in, the CEO sounds flaky or something like that. Anyway, uh, we had a project to uh, which we call speech to text, which um, uses deep learning to um, uh, to ingest the audio and produce like a clean transcript, um, which is which is pretty challenging. Um, we ended up being so uh, yeah so. Um, we partnered with NVIDIA on this project uh, so we could leverage their compute. So I would say, yeah, computation is a huge challenge. Um, you know, we were seeking industry partnerships to sort of abate this. So we, we found that we can sort of collaborate with NVIDIA. We can say, especially, you know, S&P is this huge data company. We, we can say, we have this data, you know, we can help you train your models if you can, um, if you can loan us compute. Uh, another question. Uh, the question reads, for large enterprises such as biopharma or finance, to what extent is the management of, or governance of company data presenting challenges for pushing the boundaries of data science and AI? Put another way, what are some of the topmost challenges facing private companies 
toward making data science and AI more effective in supporting core business functions. Um, so there's a couple of things here. Um, let me just parse the question. Um, so management or governance of company data presenting challenges. So I, I mean, you could in interpret this a few ways and let me know if I'm, I'm misinterpreting it. Um, but in lots of companies, I, I haven't seen that many companies in my short career, but uh, in lots of them, I suspect that the data management is a complete mess. Um, I mean, you have, uh, you know, probably multiple different databases with different schemas. Um, the way that, you know, probably different teams accessing them for different reasons. It's not like uh, a beautiful sort of utility for the company. They're sort of maybe grown up in an organic way in, in silos. Um, and this provides, uh, you know, huge challenges. So for instance, one of the, one of the products that I mentioned, um, let me scroll up and go to the relevant slide. So we have this whole product called link, um, which will take, uh, you know, you know, so maybe you have databases of private companies. Um, they all report things slightly different ways. You know, so you have in one database, you have Apple and the other one, you have Apple computer or Apple Inc. Um, you know, so, so we, we have a whole product, which is just built around, uh, merging these things. Um, so that, that's, that's one issue. Um, I would say, so, so just like when you have structured data, organizing it in a sane and consistent way across, uh, across an organization is a challenge. Um, another one is, uh, you can imagine if companies didn't use PDFs to, uh, report their financials, but instead, you know, there was some consistent standard globally, um, where people would structure their data. Uh, this whole project that I just explained to you would not exist. Right. So, um, another challenge is maybe, um, you know, for, uh, companies communicating with, uh, other companies or, or third parties in general, um, you know, representing things in a structured way, as opposed to like cutting a PDF, uh, you know, is just a chance, a challenge for the whole industry. Um, another question, can you tell us about other problems that Kensho is solving using ML solutions, speech to text just now and matching company names across databases? Um, what are some other applications? Um, okay. So those are, those are two of the big ones. Uh, a third one is sort of one of the more mature projects is, um, something I alluded to very briefly on this slide here, which is, um, so, uh, named entity recognition and, and disambiguation. So, um, the idea is to, uh, make something that will work that, that is pretty flexible across different, uh, types of text that will go through the text and identify mentions of things that it knows about. So maybe you hand it a sec filing, and it goes through and it underlines all of the companies, uh, people, places, organizations that it knows about. And it provides you with a link to uh, some reference to it. So maybe it's uh, capital IQ, which is one of SMP's platforms. Maybe it's the Wikipedia page. Um, you can link to, to different knowledge bases. So this problem is called named entity recognition and disambiguation. And one of the projects we're working on is sort of a, a reader that combines a lot of these things. So you can open up a uh, SEC filing um, you know, and it will sort of annotate all these things that you care about. It will find tables and let you extract them to, uh, Excel. So we're, you know, so in addition to the NERD thing, um, something we're working on is sort of composing these different, um, these, these different capabilities into, uh, into a single product. Uh, thanks for your question. I have a question, Chester. Um, yeah. I think, uh, you know, maybe, maybe five, 10 years ago, if I had, had seen the problem that you described, I would have probably thought about, um, let's say, building a taxonomy, maybe writing a um, hierarchical probabilistic model to somehow represent a distribution over the structure of those, of those documents. Um, the question I have for you is, is, is how much of what you do today is deep learning versus how much are you using in, let's say, your work um, probabilistic methods, hierarchical, probabilistic methods, alternate approaches. Sure. Yeah. So, um, let me see if I can answer that. Uh, so we're not using probabilistic programming here, although I love probabilistic programming. If, um, you know, we could probably shoehorn it in if, if we, we really wanted. Um, 
the answer is that we are doing a couple of things simultaneously. One is, you know, when we first uh, saw this problem, what we did is we broke it up into smaller problems. Um, and some of these we can uh, address with heuristics and rules, and some of them we can uh, use machine learning for. Um, so, for instance, you know, uh, uh, our, our first stab at uh, table structure recognition was just heuristics and rules. So, you know, finding out which text boxes are aligned, this sort of thing, we would miss, you know, connections like this, uh, like this one. But um, you can get pretty far with like regular expressions and and uh, some simple rules. Um, things like disambiguation. So, you know, figuring out what uh, what this is, um, we are. So, so that is something that um, is more amenable to to machine learning. Um, so, as you know, our, our first take is we you know we we conceptually like break this up into blocks and and we approach each one maybe with machine learning maybe maybe without. Um, but what what we're working on now is is seeing uh, how far would like an end to end can an end to end solution go? You know, so can we pass in um, a PDF and get uh, everything out completely structured? If not, maybe can we pass in a PDF and get sort of these connections? So we can can we flatten the table to sort of line up this number with all of these things? Um, this is something that that we're working on right now. So sort of after we roll out something that basically uh, that basically works, sort of separately, we have this R and D initiative to see like how few models do we need um, to do this, and and that's something for which deep learning is is pretty promising. Um, but you know, I would I would love to to be able to use probabilistic programming here too, and, and you probably could. Um, that makes sense. On the uh, end to end topic, I, I was I was thinking through the following. This is a little bit random, but in a way, you're 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 using machine learning to generate structured data, and like that structured data is consumed by people, but it's also consumed now by other ML methods. So you, you've got ML taking unstructured to structured, you've got ML consuming structured and then doing things. Um, you know, why do that? Why not go directly from unstructured data directly to whatever the decision problem is that the end user cares about? Why go through the structured data in between? Yeah, um, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, I imagine that theoretically, like you could uh, you know, go from here is, so maybe this is like too broad, but like here are, uh, you know, filings for a hundred companies, tell me which company to invest in or something like that. Um, you know, practically speaking, um, I think some of these intermediate structured forms can be relevant to like more than one purpose. Right. So, uh, you know, if we can produce something structured, then, you know, maybe one investor takes it and use it for its systematic investment process. You know, maybe somebody else takes it and you know cleans it and puts it into a database and sells it. Um, so I think these sort of intermediate results can, you know, you, you can do a certain amount of work that uh, then multiple parties can benefit from. If everything is end to end, then you sort of repeat. Everyone has to repeat um, some of that work. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? And yeah, yeah. Um... Let me ask a couple more questions, and then if there are no more questions, we'll wrap up. Um, I wonder if you have an example of a problem that is difficult and important, but doesn't get enough attention in academia. Uh, sure. So that's a that's a good question. Um, so I would, I mean, it sounds silly, but I, I would actually put this problem, I would propose this problem. So. Um, in academia, like, like I have not really seen a paper that is, that is treating like the problem in full generality, in particular, um, the disambiguation piece. So there's lots of papers that will try to, uh, you know, find tables. So table structure recognition is like uh, a problem that, that people dabble in OCR. So if you have an image of a document, you know, uh, correctly transcribe the characters. Uh, this is, you know, th this is a well-defined problem. Um, you know, text classification for sure. Uh, I, what, what I think, you know, the, the need that we have um, that is not so far like directly treated in, in academia is the whole disambiguation piece. So one is you have to, you know, find that this is a table, um, but you need to flatten it out. So you need to associate it with all of these things that, that matter to it. 
And you need to sort of like assign it an identity. You know, you need to say that this number here is, you know, cash at central banks at December 31st, 2018. You know, so so the whole like not only the the learning the structure and associating these these headers together, but like the the disambiguation piece. Um, you know that that is something that I, I don't think I've really seen um, a general framework for. I mean, there's there's this paper which is which is doing that, um, but it's it's for a particular domain, um, which is like machine learning papers. Yeah, that's really fascinating. That 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 feels a little bit like an assignment problem, but I have a, a kind of optimization problem, and I'm trying to find the right maximum scored way to um, associate the different pieces of information with each other on the screen. That's right. Yeah. So it's not only do we have to figure out what these things are. This is a number. This is a certain metric. This is the year 2018. But we have to like link them together. Um, so we're we're experimenting with with different ideas for this. Um, for, for doing these in like a single or, or you know, a uh, couple models, but um, there's not really a playbook that, that we're following. We're sort of experimenting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got one follow on question from Glenn, if you want to take Great. that. Uh, could you elaborate more on why you are not using probabilistic models? Um, you know, honestly, if so, so I like probabilistic models. Um, I think you know they buy you some additional interpretability, especially on like uncertainties for the outputs. I guess I would just say um, we ha like the, the the simple, maybe silly answer to this is that we just haven't thought of a particular implementation of them. Um, so, but if you know if, if we could if we sat down and we tried to frame this as, as such a problem, maybe, maybe um, we could get somewhere. But we haven't uh, we haven't done that yet. Uh, Chester, just to wrap up, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about how much of what you currently do involves human in the loop, either for crowdsourcing labels or other things that you might be using humans for, maybe learning by demonstration. Um, and then I, I wondered if you could close just by telling us a little bit about what is important for you at Kensho in, in hiring people in this space. Yeah, sure. Okay, so to the first question regarding labels, uh, one of the things I learned when I came to Kensho is that labels are really hard to get. And frequently, you know, in, in school, you see a lot of problems and are like, here's the data, here's the labels. A lot of time you don't have labels and a big part of the challenge is just seeing uh, how you can get labels, right? So um, there's, uh, there's ways you can combine like different programmatic methods of, of generating generating labels. So there's like uh, this thing called snorkel we've looked at. To give you a couple concrete examples, um, for this particular problem, for data extraction that I've been showing you, we are really fortunate to have some labels. So uh, the way this is done, which I didn't really talk about, the way this is done at S&P is they have a custom software system and there are uh, lots and lots of people who put these through. There's some sort of, their, their rules are heuristics based, um, but they actually ultimately will combine, they'll, they'll say, um, you know, we actually we have source tagging. So they say at this location in the document, there is this number. The number is one two six zero zero two. The currency is millions of pounds. The date is thirty first, twenty eighteen, um, and it is mapped to a certain financial metric. So we have a ton of those labels. Um, they don't give you everything, so they don't say that this is where the date came from. Um, but so so uh, part of the challenge is like there's this exhaust that's produced from their uh, industrial practices and how do we uh, take this exhaust and uh, use it to generate labels in, in an efficient way. So uh, this is a big part of, of the challenge. Um, for other projects like Link, this uh, entity linking, we do have a human in the loop. So uh, we start with somebody coming, uh, producing a few hundred data points, sometimes that is us. These, this can be machine learning engineers who say, I'm gonna take two hours and just label a bunch of data and that'll be a start. Um, once you have you know, some like base uh, you know, set of labels, you can often make it more efficient by you know, running inference with your model and trying to find where the model is confused. Um, so if the model's very certain about something, um, you, know, you can just uh, maybe ignore it, but if the model you know, spits out a score of like 50%, you can go and label that one. Um, so we do that for, for this project. Um, okay, regarding your second question, 
uh, what was the second question? It was what Kencha's looking for in hiring, yeah. is that right? Yeah. And tell us a little bit about what you like about your experience there as well. Sure, yeah. So um, what I liked about Kencho, especially early on, but, but it still is sort of um, manifest now, is uh, the people who are doing, who are data scientists or machine learning engineers are writing production code. And the thing I would say that is, if I would like go back and I were a student again and I would tell myself what something to do, it would be to um, get practice and experience uh, coding in a collaborative setting. So, uh, you know, I can only really speak to for engineering right now, but um, like learning, uh, learning version control systems like Git um, might sound sound simple, but uh, adds a lot like having some a github profile with some some uh, of your own work there um, you know we, we definitely look for that um, this is less important before you get hired but uh, you know something I've learned is like there's a whole uh, shift from like writing code that works to writing code that works and is also meant to be read by other people um, so we have you know especially people coming from like scientific uh, coding backgrounds, you know, people just kind of put together all sorts of stuff. It's like whatever works, it works. Um, the coding standards at Kensho are very high. Some people don't like that. Um, some people do like that. I mean, there's there's definitely pros and cons. I'm not saying it's like, uh, uh, you know, unambiguously a good thing. Um, but we have like a, a pretty rigorous code review process, which helps everybody learn. So people come in, you know, with like, not rudimentary coding, but they've only ever coded like during graduate school or something. And, you know, within a year or so they're writing production code and, uh, you know, they learned a lot about how computers work. So, you know, I would say, um, you know, learning how to, or, or getting practice coding in a collaborative setting, um, doing things like, uh, so having a GitHub page where you post some project just to show, um, you know, some examples of, of your own, your own programming. Um, yeah. I think that also helps for interviews to have some sort of like uh, outside project or something that you know you can you can talk about um, during the interview process. All right. Well, thank you, Chester. That was uh, that was a wonderfully kind of lucid and accessible look at some of the ways that industry is using ML now to clean up data, which is one of the most important parts of the data science pipeline. Um, also, thanks to those of you out in the audience for participating and sending questions. Um, I hope you're joining me in sending uh, uh, your karma to uh, Chester for his presentation. Um, just in closing, I just want to mention that the next Harvard Data Science Initiative Industry Seminar will be on November the 5th and will feature Elsevier. So I hope that some of you can join us then. Uh, but for now, um, wish everybody a great rest of the day and uh, stay safe and um, enjoy the afternoon. And thanks again, Chester. Thanks very much.